Hello and welcome to a special edition of Granada Reports. We are live in the centre of Manchester as the city prepares to mark the fifth anniversary of the arena terrorist attack in which 22 people were killed and hundreds more were injured. Here's what's lined up on the programme this evening. Never forgotten, five years on, people here will remember those who lost their lives on a night that changed the city forever. How the simple work at B brought so many of us together in those difficult days after the bombing. I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason. And still singing loud and proud, a special performance from the Manchester Survivors Choir. From folk to flamenco, Manchester prepares to host its very first guitar festival. And today has officially been World Bee Day. I'll have more of your photos. Of course, the weekend weather forecast later on in the programme. Well, this is a beautiful, tranquil memorial in the heart of Manchester with the names of the 22 people who died etched on the beautiful stone, the halo at the centre of this garden. Now, we had hoped to give you a closer look, but the Manchester weather hasn't been kind to us today. But despite the rain, throughout the day, people have been coming here to the Memorial Garden for quiet reflection. So many people have been touched forever by what's happened that night five years ago, when a suicide bomber from Manchester detonated his device at a concert packed full of young people. We'll be speaking to a grandfather who lost his granddaughter in a moment. But we'll also remember the outpouring of support with the city's worker bee being a symbol of hope with thousands of people getting a bee tattoo. My colleague Tasha Kachiri has been speaking to some of those to see what they make of it now, five years on. I got a bee tattoo. I got a bee tattoo. I got a bee tattoo. I got my bee tattoo. We didn't know the extent of passion and feeling that it was going to create. The numbers that turned out were just astronomical. They were queuing all the way around the streets, around the blocks. Police emergency. Hi, we, we think we heard an explosion uh, by Victoria train station. My daughter uh, was at that concert on that night and when my husband came to tell me that the bomb had gone off, it was just the most horrendous feeling ever as a parent. And in that time period of it going off to me actually getting hold of her, it, it was just the worst time of my life. When I left the arena through the doors, I remember walking past the city room I seen a lot of parents sat on the steps outside the McDonald's, I think it was. They were just stood there waiting innocently um, for, the, for the kids to come out of the concert. And as we know, some of them never made it home. My sister and I, we were in sort of a block where we couldn't get out from the front. There were fences in front of us and we were sort of trapped in. And so I, I held her hand and then I said to her, right, mum's at home and she's going to hear this on the news and she's going to panic. So. You try and ring mum and I'm going to try and ring dad and find out where he is. If you're from Manchester or even if you aren't, chances are the arena bombing left an impact on you too. It's one of those things that you never think is going to happen to you and it really did change my perspective on life completely. In the aftermath, swarms of people got bee tattoos, each one for a different reason. We just need something, um, I think, to yeah, represent it and as closure. It's like a tribute to my daughter, but obviously all those who died. It's just a show of solidarity, really, just to, to um, come together as, as a community and, and help one another. Quite a few young girls had lost their lives. That really sort of stuck with me. and. I just felt like I wanted to feel that as I was doing ordinary teenage stuff, that they were like living it through me, things that they'd never get to experience. It just reminds me of how lucky I am. I, I've no regrets and I, I share that tattoo with a lot of people. It's, um, it, it's a nice thing. 
The idea for the tattoos came from a woman called Sam Barber. With the help of hundreds of tattoo artists from across the region, they raised more than half a million pounds for the victims, families and survivors of the bombing. Initially it was just, we just wanted to help. To me it seemed the obvious choice to pick the B symbol, because we was like, okay, let, we need to do something. I'm a tattooist, so I'll do a tattoo. Okay, what's fast? And instantly it was like, oh, the B, the B tattoo, I'll do the B tattoo. Me and some of the guys who I tattoo with and some of my mates at his studio, we all got together, did one huge like day event from early hours till like three in the morning. And we literally just had let everybody come down and get a tattoo. Now these tattoos have come to not just symbolize hope and solidarity, but a movement and identity. Even people that are visiting from different countries that come in and the one to Manchester B, to say that they've been to Manchester. If someone sees that you've got Manchester B, they'll tell you where they were on that day. I'm proud to be part of it, definitely, yeah. For the people who first got them, they represent pride, community, and the Mancunian way of life. Manchester is a community of people who gather together when things go wrong. Um, and as it shows with the B, B tattoo and other events that they've done, uh, we're stronger together as a community and shouldn't let these people think that they can just do what they like and think that's going to change the way we do things. We're northerners, we're made of hard stuff. Well, Steve Goodman is with me and he has several B tattoos. He lost his 15-year-old granddaughter, Olivia Campbell Hardy, in the attack. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us tonight, even in this terrible, terrible rain. And you say it gets worse every year, Steve. It gets harder because you never know where you, what's going to happen and where you're going to be, but yeah. And Olivia more. would have been 21 this year. She would be 21 in, in November, and it's going to be a big time for her to have a birthday in all this. Yeah. What does it mean to you to be able to come to this beautiful memorial? Does that make a difference on the anniversary? It will do, because uh, with it being opened by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, um, with the nearest family to it, we'll use it quite a lot. You were there when it was opened and you were really touched by what Prince William said. He was very genuine, he always has been, um, but it was the first time we've met Kate and she was just as lovely. And tell us a little bit about Olivia. She was a really talented singer, wasn't she? She was a lovely singer and a great ballroom dancer and she thought the world was made for Olivia. <laughs> it's her playground and you miss her so very much, but you have set up a charity in her name and you're supporting a Ukrainian refugee. We are at the moment, yes, a young boy that's come over with his mother and grandfather, uh, grandmother because his grandfather is waiting to sign up and his dad's already fighting in the forces. And does that give you and the family some comfort being able to help people in Olivia's name? Being able to help anybody in Olivia's name is fantastic. Um, it's like Olivia giving the singing lesson or the dance lesson herself. Now, music is a big part of your life and a big comfort, and you've joined the Survivors Choir. What has that given you? The Survivors Choir means some, so much to us because we've uh, all been through the same trauma, and we get by with just giving people, each other a hug and singing together, and it's a big family now. It is an absolutely big family. Steve, thank you so much for talking to us tonight. And we will be thinking of you and all of the other families on Sunday. And Gamal, just before I hand back to studio, uh, we will be hearing a little bit more from the Survivors Choir a bit later in the programme. The funeral has taken place of Katie Kenyon, the mother of two whose body was found at Gisborne near Lancashire last month. A horse-drawn carriage led the cortege to St Leonard's Church where more than 200 people were gathered, many of them wearing Katie's favourite colour of purple. A man has been charged with her murder and is due to stand trial later this year.
A 14-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of arson after a huge fire broke out in Preston city centre last night. Police, paramedics and 12 fire engines were called to tackle the blaze at the Odeon Cinema and what used to be Tokyo Joe's nightclub. The fire is now under control, but the building is unsafe, so is being demolished over the weekend. Uh, Douglas is to become the first and only city in the Isle of Man uh, as part of the uh, Queen's Jubilee celebrations. The Borough Council applied for the city status as part of a civic honours competition. It's one of eight locations to be given the royal honour. OK, uh, here's what's still to come on the ITV News at 6.30 with Charlene. The Prime Minister says he won't block names being published in Sue Gray's report into government parties during lockdown. Boris Johnson says he's looking forward to seeing its contents pretty soon. It could lead to tragedy. The warning from one Premier League manager after another violent pitch invasion. And 38 towns applied, but only eight have been crowned cities. We'll tell you why and where. So join us for those stories and so much more from 6.30. Yeah, glad to see uh, one of their cities is uh, one of ours. Um, on to sport now. And with one day left of the Premier League season, there is still all to play for at both ends of the table. Chris? Yeah, we'll come to the relegation battle shortly, but let's start with the title race. And after 37 Premier League matches each, only one point separates leaders Manchester City from title rivals Liverpool. Steven Gerrard will be hoping his Aston Villa team can stop City and hand the title back to his old club, who must beat Wolves to stand any chance of lifting the trophy. David Chisnell has been hearing from both camps. It's been nine months in the making and now Manchester City and Liverpool's battle to be crowned English champions goes to the final weekend of the Premier League season. But just like in 2019, there's only one point separating the two teams going into the last game. City came out on top back then and once again have destiny in their own hands, knowing a win at home against Aston Villa and they'll lift the trophy for the fourth time in five years. As a club, we have not been here many, many, many times in our time. So once we are here, have to be anxious, nervous, or no, no way. Go there and try to enjoy the moment and suffer the moment because it will be moments and the moments we concede a goal just in case or we are struggling, come on, let's go, try again, try again until the end. As a Liverpool player, Steven Gerrard won it all except for the Premier League. Legend already, and I think if he, if he did get results against Man City and Liverpool won, it'd be a god. If they win the quadruple, no, I'd have to go. I'd have to say, no, this will be the best Liverpool squad ever. Steve will take it 100% serious. I'm, I'm sure without me calling him or whatever, I don't have to. Probably the, the rest of the club did it already, you know, but I didn't. But this is the game I'm not concerned about, I'm not thinking about at all. It's completely disrespectful to, to Wilhelm Mondros because they don't come here and want to be part of our celebration. Well, City lost out to Liverpool in the FA Cup semi-final this season. They've had to watch them lift two trophies already this year, but no, the Premier League remains the biggest prize. I would say because it's more difficult. There's a lot of weeks, a lot of games. When you fight the Premier League and you have success right at the end, give you the, the sense that you enjoy a lot during the... You know, we are happier in our lives, private life, in our job when you win. There's been plenty for both clubs to smile about this season, but who has the last laugh in the league will be decided on Sunday. David Chisnell, ITV News. Well, a title win would cap a fine first season at City for Jack Grealish, who's taken time out of his build-up to praise the courage of Blackpool's Jake Daniels. This week, he became the first active male pro footballer in the UK to come out as gay, a decision applauded by Grealish. Oh, I think it's brilliant. Uh, I really do. Um, I think it's a big step in, in English football. Um, you know, Jake being the, the first um, first male, you know, in the English game to come out. I think it shows a lot of courage. Um, and yeah, I'm just so happy for him, and, and, and I hope he, he knows that he's um, he's made the right decision and a great decision. Well, Grealish was speaking at the McDonald's Fun Football programme, which is offering a million children free coaching. And after these lucky ones got to play with a City star, some of them got to meet our own Mike Hall too. Why is Jack Grealish one of your favourite players? Because he can score loads of goals when he's so far away. What have you said to him? 
I like his hair. You like his hair? When I went on the pitch, I started like trying to mix him and um, playing with him and stuff. It was really fun. You know, some of them have been brilliant here, even some of the children with disabilities and stuff. You know, My little sister, uh, Holly, has cerebral palsy and, and to see all these with the same with the same disability out here, enjoying themselves, um, playing with each other and playing with a smile on their face. It's, it's, it's so nice to see. Well, in other football news, Everton say they are confident they have complied with the Premier League's financial fair play rules after reports that Burnley and Leeds will launch legal action against the club and the league. Well, I'm full of thanks tonight. Thanks to the fans for taking me on board and, and supporting the players. They've driven us over the line. Um, thanks to the to the board and the owner for the players because as much as I spoke about the fans in the last six weeks, players did that today. Players, we packed it. We, we're buzzing and, and it's something that we can give back to the fans. We've not really given them a, a good season this year and and hopefully we can we can send them off uh, happy and and staying in the league. And we know Sunday's going to be emotional. You've got to try and take that out of it. Use some of it. Use it as a bit of fire inside you as well. But I'm sure that'll be there and uh, go and attack the moments again. And one breaking bit of football news tonight is that Salford City have a new boss. Neil Wood has left his role as coach of Manchester United's under-23s to take over the post at the League Two club, which was vacated by Gary Bowyer. Big title race weekend. Looking forward to it immensely. Yeah, Chris, is a huge weekend uh, for football. If you were a betting man, my friend, who'd your money be on? That's such a brutal question. <laughs> Look, Manchester City are bound to be favourites. They hold the advantage. Yeah. They're playing at home. You'd expect them to do well. But you can't take the emotion out of the occasion. You can never back against Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool, so I'm sitting firmly on the fence. <laughs> uh, an exciting weekend ahead. Chris, cheers. Thank you. Uh, now, guitar players are in for a treat this weekend as the Manchester Guitar Festival gets underway. It's taking place around the Stoller Hall in Manchester. As well as the likes of flamenco from Spain, there's also jazz from Liverpool and one of the semi-finalists of the guitar star TV show, Becky Langdon from uh, Rochdale. Uh, Tim Scott has this report. Becky Langan practices her chops in the Stoller Hall ahead of her appearance at the Manchester Guitar Festival. Becky, who's from Rochdale, was a semi-finalist on TV's Guitar Star and now travels the world as a professional musician. My dad played the guitar so I was naturally just drawn to it because it was around the house. Um, I've never been a singer and in 2006 I came across a video called Drifting by Andy McKee on YouTube. What he does is absolutely incredible and I've, I just saw it and I was like, that's exactly what I want to do. So you play Manchester Guitar Festival at the weekend for a Rochdale girl. This is virtually a, a hometown gig, isn't it? I've always loved Manchester. Um, they've always been really kind to musicians, very welcoming. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this festival looks absolutely pheno phenomenal and there's some amazing acts and I can't wait. Meanwhile, in Liverpool, Charlie, my boy, oh, Charlie, my boy, me This is the ukulele off trio who play authentic 1920s jazz. But what attracted these former punk rockers to this old school music in the first place? Tracing back the roots of the music yeah. you were listening to. Yeah, it's from just 60s music to 50s. Yeah, yeah. Keep going back. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you know what? He's, it's... He's, he reads sheet music now. He doesn't listen to music anymore. Like, <laughs> he just reads sheet music of a night before he goes to bed. <laughs> Once you say ukuleles, I think people have a certain idea because we're called the ukulele off trio. People have a certain idea of what they're going to see. They think they're going to get George Formby, basically. I think that's what it is, yeah. Sadly, there'll be no George Formby tunes at the Manchester Guitar Festival, but there will be something for everyone. There's also tons of workshops and tutorials that guitar players of all abilities can come and join in. And it all kicks off tonight at the Stoller Hall. Tim Scott, ITV News, Manchester. It looks fun. Um, OK, let's uh, cross back to uh, Elaine. It's the uh, Glade of Lights Memorial in Manchester. So city uh, marks five years since the arena bombing. Uh, Elaine, what is planned for this weekend? 
Well, I'm sure it will be a very poignant day for many. Here at the Glade of Light Memorial, I'm sure, will also be a focus for many people during the events planned this weekend. On Sunday, people will be able to come here and pay their own tributes. And there'll also be acts of remembrance at Manchester Cathedral. The doors will be open here all day and the bells will toll at 10.31, the exact time the bomb went off. Elsewhere, silences will be held at Victoria Rail Station, where each of the 22 victims will be remembered individually. And tributes will be paid at the Great Manchester Run, where a minutes of applause will be held. But from me and the team in a very wet Manchester, we leave you with the sounds of the Manchester Survivors Choir, showing the power of music in the very darkest of times. Good night. Now that is brew weather. And only boiling what she needs. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Big up you, sis. Hello, a very good evening to you. Today is officially World Bee Day. This is Vicky Bartnett's husband Dave and grandson Jake very proudly looking after their bees in Ellesmere Port. And Holly Walsh, who is 10, saw these bees making home in an abandoned bird box. And I actually learned something about bees today from Sue Appleton. The males can be identified by their size and their mustard moustache. I've popped a lot more info and, of course, more of your photos on our website, itv.com slash Granada slash weather. So back to the weather. The weekend is almost upon us. Tomorrow is still looking like the better day. Drier, slightly brighter, an odd shower. And then on Sunday, more cloud around, higher risk of some showery outbreaks of rain 
and feeling a little fresher there onwards into next week. High pressure doesn't really make headway northwards tomorrow. And then from Sunday, we've basically got our weather from the Atlantic. So there will be further showery outbreaks of rain as we head into the new week and temperatures taking a little bit of a dip, struggling to get to the average. So the best of the weather after a few evening showers will be tonight, dry and clear with fairly light winds. And that will allow the temperatures to tumble a little bit away from towns and cities. So we're looking at rural lows of around five or six celsius there are some times for tomorrow against last night's sunset five o'clock and nine fifteen tomorrow the best of the sunshine coming through in the morning a bright start a dry start but there will be some patchy cloud developing throughout the day small chance of an isolated shower but many dry and with slightly lighter winds in the sunny spells and 18 celsius so feeling a little bit more pleasant in the sunshine tomorrow compared to today on sunday there will be more cloud packing in from the west and a higher risk of some showery outbreaks of rain there will be some drier slots to highs of around 18 and then fresher into next week. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Two sugars, please. Ah, oh, lovely. Hello, Summer. Piri sponsors ITV Pollen Count. Well, there's definitely some pollen around in the air for the pollinators as we head into the weekend. Maybe not quite as much as this past week with the dry and warm conditions. And back to low on Monday with showers merging to longer spells of rain. Have a good weekend.